as we prepare for Sundays in the coming weeks that will look much different than many of us are used to. My prayer is that patience and grace will guide our lives. And I'm confident that although distanced, we will continue to grow in our faith, led by a God whose plan is greater than we can know. Continue to hold each other up, as I know you have already been doing, and we will continue to find creative solutions to worship together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis, the origin story, the very first words of the Bible read, in the beginning. Genesis may tell us of the first beginning, but we are no strangers to new beginnings. We are in the midst of the beginning of a new phase of life in our society right now, which, when it does come to an end, will lead to a new beginning after that. For the Church of the Brethren, we hold the New Testament as our rule of faith and practice, and as a guide to living out our beliefs. So as we enter this new beginning, surrounded by change and uncertainty, I thought it would be fitting to study some beginnings from the books of the New Testament particularly from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of which offer reports of the new beginning that was God's presence on earth through the life of Jesus Christ. In school, many of us learned the significance of the introduction section of an essay, the pivotal paragraph designed not only to catch the reader's attention, but to detail the importance of the subject that is the focal point of the essay. The same is true for authors who have their books published. When trying to decide whether to leave a book on the shelf or take it to continue reading, potential readers will often skim through the first paragraph, trying to get an idea of whether they will enjoy the book as a whole, gathering a crucial first impression. And if you've ever attended a conference or a convocation with a key speaker, you'll know the value of introducing an influential guest as an expert in a certain field. Certainly, the Gospel writers had quite the task before them to introduce the Son of God. So how did they choose to begin their testimonies? Matthew prioritizes credibility, beginning with a detailed ancestry. His first paragraph is the longest of the four Gospels. The heading in the New International Version reads, The Genealogy of Jesus. It begins, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and continues tracing through the lineage for 15 verses, concluding with Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Thus, Matthew points to Jesus as the fulfillment of a prophecy that was a long, long time in conception. Jesus' validity as Messiah, Matthew claims, cannot be disputed because it has been a plan in place for generations and generations. Who is Jesus Christ? Why should we listen to his story? Matthew replies, Jesus Christ is the descendant of many great and influential men and women. And if you keep reading, you will discover he is the descendant of one greater still than all of them. William Barclay, author of the Daily Study Bible series, points out in agreement that the past does not become insignificant, but in fact fully deserves the position Matthew gives it at the forefront of his gospel text. Barclay writes, history can never be a road that leads to nowhere. We may not use prophecy in the same way our fathers did, but at the back of the fact of prophecy lies the eternal fact that life and the world are not on the way to nowhere, but on the way to the goal of God. Mark also begins his Gospel Testament with the promise of a prophecy fulfilled, but he chooses to open with a more concrete example, the story of John the Baptist. The introductory paragraph of the book of Mark spans the first eight verses of text and reads, The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, 
make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made from camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. When Matthew was certifying Jesus' authenticity as the Son of God, Mark focuses his introduction on the meaning Jesus coming to earth will hold for the well-being of humanity, not only for the first disciples of Jesus, but for us as well. Pastor Mark E. Yers, in a discussion of this text, relates it to our current society, reflecting, there is no question that life in the 21st century North America poses strong challenges to the church. A people faced with these difficulties can think them unprecedented and so strong that congregations have impossible odds against them. Pastoral help can come from digging down into history, particularly in scripture, to discover the resources to be found there. Mark anchors the story he's about to tell in the scriptures, particularly in the prophets. The material from Isaiah was more than 600 years old when Mark put it to use. He realized he was writing for the present, but he drew upon the past. Like Mark, we can find yesterday full of profound help for today. Stability can come when we see that the faith we profess has seen people through all manner of circumstances, and there is no reason to believe it will be undone by those we face. Luke is the only gospel writer to begin his text with a formal introduction even introducing himself and his own credibility as a writer. Verses 1 through 4 of the book of Luke read, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. There's no mention of Jesus by name in Luke's introductory paragraph, although the person to whom he was writing likely had no doubts what events Luke was referencing. Luke's words can lead us to believe that if they had access to television and social media then, the story of Jesus would probably have been all anyone was talking about. So Luke would have had no reason to clarify what everyone was already focusing on. He was simply offering his own educated take on the situation. Pastor James R. Luck Jr. offers his perspective, stating, We live in a time when many of our congregations are hurting. Many of us are leeching members, some generations have all but disappeared from our pews, and we are unsure about how to fund our ministries. There is a yearning for the glory days of yesterday that are no more. In the midst of such change, our congregations need reassuring. So what will happen? How can the tide be turned? The answers are not clear. Perhaps we need to spend less time talking about doctrinal differences and more time sharing stories. Tell Luke's story. Tell our story. Tell your story. Tell the story of God's redeeming love through which we make sense of the chaos of the world. After all, there was a time when Christianity was spread not through force or coercion, but through the fascination and awe of a story. Whether we can rediscover and foster again such wonder may say much about the chapters that we have yet to write. When we share our stories with others, we become part of their stories and they become part of ours. His words remind me of one of my favorite childhood movies, The Never-Ending Story. Released in 1984 and based on a book of the same title, it takes place in a fantasy world called Fantasia, in a land which contains all of human imagination and possibility, and which in the movie is under threat from a force called the Nothing, which represents the loss of hope and dreams. The main character spends much of the movie trying to keep Fantasia from falling into nothing, 
by continuing to tell the story he dreams could be and sharing that story with others to tell in their own way as they hope things could be. Because all along, imagining a better future is what keeps the story going. What are we meant to do in such a time as this? if not to strive to continue the story that began far before us. This is not a time to give up. It is only a new beginning. John, in the last of the four Gospels, begins his introduction of Jesus with these nine verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. For John, the thing to be emphasized from the beginning is that Jesus is God's light for the world. It makes me think of a line from the Charlie Brown book, Happiness is a Warm Puppy, which lists many little things in life that can bring people joy. One being, happiness is a nightlight. For a young child reading that book, it's a very literal statement. I remember having a nightlight growing up, and without it, I had to sleep with the door cracked open so the light from the hall could filter in, or I would begin to feel too alone in the darkness. As adults, happiness is a nightlight could mean something less literal. Perhaps happiness in dark times is a different kind of light in the darkness. The light of God that is Jesus Christ as John describes him. All four gospel writers prioritize a different aspect of Jesus for their opening paragraphs, but all four prioritize Jesus as the prophesied savior of the world. The end of one phase of life may only mean the beginning of a new one. Many of you may be familiar with what a prayer labyrinth is, The Upper Room Dictionary of Christian Spiritual Formation defines it well as a serpentine path used as a spiritual tool to help those who walk grow in their relationship with God. Continuing while they walk it, pilgrims might offer the time to God or meditate on a pressing question, a breath prayer, or a passage of scripture. Most labyrinths are constructed by interlinking a set of concentric circles. The Seventh Circuit Cretian Labyrinth has its origins 3,000 years ago. And many medieval cathedrals had labyrinths inlaid in their floors as a means whereby pilgrims could make a pilgrimage locally. Such as the Eleventh Circuit Labyrinth in Chartres Cathedral in France, built in the 13th century. The winding path leads toward the center, toward God. Toward wholeness and integration. Many persons find it meaningful to remain a while in the center, praying and meditating. The journey out is a preparation toward offering one's gifts to others and to the larger world. Walking the labyrinth is an individual, imaginative experience that becomes more meaningful and profound the more it is walked. It is a transforming tool, a mystery leading to a wholeness of body, mind, and soul. I had the great privilege of visiting one of the grand cathedral labyrinths when I went on my January term trip to France during my junior year of college. It covered the whole floor of the worship space so that in order to fully walk it, all the chairs would need to be moved to the side of the room. It was a maze-like path, twisting around and back and forth within the larger circle, but not in a stressful way. As soon as you stepped into it, It was a contemplative space. I felt compelled to slow down and walk purposely along it toward the center, knowing that when I reached the center, I would turn and come back the way I'd come. But it was not the same walk back out of the labyrinth because my thoughts had continued on. 
My prayer had progressed. It was a new beginning. And I am sure that if I were to walk the same labyrinth again now, my thoughts and prayers would be new as well. We see the, joy, the story of Jesus begun many different ways, told and retold as it is ours to tell as well. And as each new day begins, we have the opportunity to continue living our lives and telling our own stories of patience and grace, of peace and hope, starting in the beginning. Please pray with me. God of comfort, we find ourselves surrounded more and more by people who are tired and afraid. We confess that we too have felt tired and afraid, wondering how much change we can take before it overwhelms us, questioning events that have left us unsure of how to live or uncertain that we are doing what is right, wanting to live as light in this world, but feeling limited or unprepared, separated and disconnected when what we desire most is to feel consoled and safe together with everyone who we care for and who cares for us. We pray for health and recovery, for the knowledge that comes with time and the wisdom to act on that knowledge. We pray for leaders making difficult decisions that affect the lives of others. Grant them peace. We pray for those who wake up to worries every day about protection and survival. Alleviate their stress. Draw us closer to you so that we may see the vision you have for all of us. Allow us to trust despite our fears. In your gracious name we pray. Amen.